Hello? Murat. How are you? Murat, I'm good. How are you doing? We are okay. We are okay. I tried to make it YouTube live as well, but I, I did it. Yes. That's it. Good. Okay, okay. Sorry about it. No, all good. Uh, just one more, one more thing. I have to fix it. Of course. Then uh, be done. Okay. Okay. This is fantastic technique, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm working for Federation uh, last two years as a coaches development department, the secretary general. Yeah. So we have a couple of young coaches and uh, I put them together and try to help them. Uh, sometimes makes uh, use my network to have different vision with uh, with experienced coaches. Yeah. So this group uh, give me an idea to use the Zoom. So yeah. this is our thirty fifth uh, talks. They say not a clinic, but talks. Yeah. So we have uh, many uh, foreign coaches, foreign players who who work for our league. Uh, women or men's. Uh, yeah. so, uh, Tolga knew you and make the make the contact with you. Uh, so uh, thank you for Tolga and he he will be there as well. Cool. And uh, normally we we make it in our time uh, around nine o'clock uh -huh. after the after the dinner. But today we make it to eight. Yeah. So uh, we will record these uh, talks and we will put next day to our YouTube channel and yeah. I will send the links. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Perfect. Perfect for me. <laughs> and uh, how about yourself? Could you could you tell us about uh, why we are waiting for the coaches? Could you could you tell us about uh, your uh, adventure to Germany yes. to Chile. This is it. Could be very interesting, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I hope so. Perhaps you know. <laughs> are we? Uh, are, are we? You tell me when we start officially. Are we getting started? Like you tell me. Okay, I will. I will. So you say eight o'clock in Turkey is dinner time? No, I think around. You know, uh, right after tomorrow, we have Ramadan. Yes. So uh, I think uh, 10 to 8, uh, we go to eat. Yeah. Uh, so now uh, we may change the time right after the Ramadan. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but uh, we can start right now officially. Okay. Uh, we are on live in YouTube as well. Uh, I think... You may start with your adventure, Germany to G League, then yeah. uh, we will follow you. All right. Sounds good for me. Okay. So my name is Martin Schiller and I'm the head coach for the G League affiliates for the Utah Jazz, the Salt Lake City Stars. And um, yeah, before, uh, before I keep introducing or talking, I really want to say thank you. You know, I'm a big fan and friend of Turkish basketball and Turkish culture itself. You know, growing up in Germany, I grew up with a lot of Turkish friends. So I played in Turkey often and I really respect. So thank you for having me. I'm really, uh, really thankful, you know. Thank you, coach, to accept him to be with us. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think generally speaking, if anybody has a question while... I'm talking, you know, the best thing is to just ask, you know, and go ahead. I think that's the best way to proceed in this process. And um, yeah, before I came here, I was um, an assistant coach in German BBL for seven seasons uh, with the Artland Dragons and with Ludwigsburg. So I uh, coached in Euro Cup and in Champions League. 
I've uh, been the assistant coach for the German national team for four summers. So um, I've coached in two European championships and one world championship. And, um, and then I got the chance to get this job here with the, with the G League team uh, for the Utah Jazz. And, um, you know, when I took the job, um, a lot of like friends from, from the NBA told me how it would be and told me how the game is played here, told me how the processes are, told me how the practices are. And I uh, listened, but I really didn't believe, you know, like uh, with a European approach and thought process of practicing two times a day, of practicing long, of having very detailed preparations for games, et cetera, et cetera. Things are a little bit different here and uh, I could really not believe. Um, and I will say it took me one season to, you know, really understand how the game is played here and to understand how I think the game should be coached um, over here. You know, and um, so there are a lot of differences. You know, I do think that both sides of the Atlantic Ocean have got like a little bit, how should I say, incorrect views of the other. You know, like a lot of young American players um, say they want to make it to the NBA. And if they don't make it to the NBA, they will just go overseas and make money. But Everybody in this meeting knows that it's not that easy. It is not easy to come to TBL in Turkey and make yourself a career in TBL. You have to be an excellent player. You have to have excellent qualities. It's just not that easy, right? And um, the same, I think, for European uh, coaches. You know, if we watch the G League, also if we watch the NBA, um, you know... We, we often say, hey, why is the intensity of the game not as high as the intensity in, in European basketball? Why is the game individual and why isn't there so much ball movement? Why is there perhaps a little bit like undisciplined tactical play, you know? And that's not true all the way either. Yes, sometimes it is, but, but not all the time. And um, I think in order to kind of understand each other and interpret each other correctly, like one really has to look at the differences of the games, you know. So, um, so today I want to talk about the differences of the game. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, our defensive principles uh, a little bit, which are also the defensive main principles of Quinn Snyder and Utah Jazz. And again, if somebody has a question, just like go ahead, you know, like, I think that's the best way to proceed. Okay, so um, for me, like the main difference is, let's start with the game itself. The game itself is 48 minutes, as you guys know. And 48 minutes, it's long. I never thought about it before, but the eight extra minutes, it's an extra quarter, you know? And that extra quarter almost explains why, um, why, you, why focus sometimes goes away why intensity sometimes goes away you know it's an extra eight minutes which just plays a role you know it's almost as simple as it gets i think the court size plays a role the court is a little wider and the court is a little bit longer um so especially defensively you cannot help shrink and stunt the floor as much as in europe you know so i think let's say pick and roll defense if you are guarding a pick and roll on the elbow and you're pushing the ball into the screen uh in europe often we we help from the from the strong side right we shrink the floor from the strong side like that type of helping just because of the space of the floor is not as easy you know so uh, that also explains, like, if we Europeans watch American basketball, like, we are like, okay, where is the help? Where is the stunt? You know, it is just not as easy. And uh, if you feel it, you kind of figure it out. You know, I think the rule interpretation is very much for the offense here, like very, very much for the offensive side of the basketball. So I always have the feeling if, as an offensive player, you get your shoulder by the hip of the defender, you have won the battle. There is no way for the defense to get back in front. 
um, there is no holding like in Europe, you know, there is no holding and grabbing and turnout screens, you know. So I want to say the interpre interpretation of the rule is for the offense and it takes away the physicality, you know, like for sure, European basketball is much more physical than uh, G League basketball and also NBA basketball. But of course, the NBA and G League basketball is much more athletic, you know, but it's due to the rules and the interpretation of the rules. Um, you know, if you, if you stick with the differences in the game, timeouts in the G League, if every coach takes all timeouts, there are 16 timeouts in the game compared to our 10, right? So um, the out of timeout plays, the ATOs play a big role in, in America. And it's almost as if like coaches are like judged by how good they are coming out of timeouts, you know? And I think the reason for that is that there are so many, you know, there are so many timeouts, it plays a much bigger role, you know? So that's the difference in, in coaching in a way. It took me a season to kind of figure uh, figure figure that out, you know. Um, a big, big in-game difference is that, and this is a huge difference to me, is that um, almost all G League and NBA teams play their games with subbing patterns. So you basically know before the game who you are going to sub when, okay? And um, it, it's, it, it was very new to me. It's very different than any European coach coaches the game, right? Like I'm friends with Erdem Chan from Fenerbahce and he's here in the summer league every summer. And it's like, you know, we discussed, like it would be like, it's completely antithesis. Like if, if like, let's say Shelko Obradovic now suddenly, right? Like goes by a pattern and, and doesn't sub by, uh, you know, performance on the floor in a way, right? So um, teams play with the subbing patterns because minutes have to be monitored very closely. Um, there are so many games, there are so many minutes to be played that playing with patterns is important. Now, having the patterns doesn't mean you stick to it 100%, but it helps you, you know? In the NBA, the main thing is monitoring the minutes. In the G League, I have a lot of, uh, I, I have rules. So my general manager will tell me a certain player, especially assigned players from the NBA, from the Utah Jazz who get signed to me, like last year, Grayson Allen, this year, Mie Oni, Nigel williams Goss. he played for Partizan and for Olympiakos they have to play a certain amount of minutes, which is good. You know, we are the farm team. And I go into the game and they have to play, let's say, 32 minutes. Okay? So I have to organize the 32 minutes. And, um, and it's almost no matter if they play good or bad, they are going to play 32 minutes. So that is such a massive difference, right? Like to European basketball, where we like sub in and sub out. Like on every, uh, you know, when the player basically is not playing well, right? Or the intensity is not there. So that's a, uh, that's a, that's a big, big, big difference, I would say, you know. Let me, um, let me, I'll try to, I'll try to show you guys real quick. Um, I'll try to show you guys real quick a subbing pattern, just to give you an example. Mm. Can you see this? I guess so, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is like a subbing pattern for us. This is quarter number one, quarter number two. And you see like literally every sub and every lineup throughout the entire game. You know who's going to start. You know who's going to end. Um, you know who... You know who at which lineups are going to be on the floor at which time, etc. Right. And I've got a coach who takes care of this. Like this is what he does. 
and it's tricky, you know, but I must say it was very weird in the beginning, but I've gotten used to it and it actually helps you organize the game very well, you know. So it's a big difference, but I do think like sometimes if we Europeans watch an NBA game and we're like, hey, why is he not subbing this guy out? You know, part of it are the subbing patterns, you know. Um, so I think big difference talking about it uh, from America to Europe at uh, the amount of games, right? Like we play 50 games in five months, the NBA 82 games in eight months. Um, I know the EuroLeague is coming, is right, is getting right there. I think the EuroLeague is unbelievably tough because also the intensity is so tough in the games, right? Um, but the amount of games plays a big, big role. So 50 games in five months means we sometimes play three games in four days, right? Or we play eight games in 12 days. That is like, you know, like in Turkish or uh, German youth basketball, you have that, right? Like where you play like a lot of games, like in a short period of time. But in the professional basketball in Turkey or in Germany, basically the only time you play a double header is in the cup final four, right? Or in European championships. That's where you can have a double header, right? Like two games and two nights. We play three games and four nights, eight games and 12 nights. And uh, it plays a role, you know, like if you watch a game uh, and, and you say, hey, what's wrong with the intensity of this game? Often you have to look at the schedule and you have to understand, oh, okay, you know, this team is on the fifth game in eight nights. It plays a big role. It's just a fact, you know. Um, last season, we played a Friday game at seven o'clock at home and played a Saturday game at five o'clock in the afternoon in Los Angeles. You know, so if you have to play those games, obviously, um, intensities are going to suffer from it, you know. Um, I think one of the biggest differences and one of the main explanations why the game is different is that there is no relegation, right? We cannot move down. So in Turkey, obviously, every game means something, right? Like Fener and Efes are playing for first seed all the time, right? To get a high seed in the playoffs. Middle pack teams are trying to get into the playoffs. Lower pack teams are going to try to stay in the league. So every weekend, like the game counts, right? Due to the fact that there is no relegation, the reality is not every game counts. Like, it's just the reality, you know? It's a different, and it's, it, it, leads to, it leads to a different basketball game, you know? Practices, very different. And this is something I could not understand before. Um, so in Europe, we can decide how long our preseason is, right? I, I would believe in Turkey, it's similar to Germany. Like, teams go between eight and six, six and eight weeks for the preseason, right? Like with eight to 10 games and then comes the season. Um, in the NBA, I think the preseason is limited by rule. Every team can only have a preseason for the same amount of time. So NBA, I think is four and a half weeks or five weeks. Um, uh, the Jazz traditionally play five preseason games. Um, I think you are only allowed two or three two a days so only two or three times in the entire season an nba team can practice two times a day so by rule you know so that's such a massive difference you know in the g league my preseason is 10 days 10 days maximum like one preseason game so it's like the the the, the practices are so much shorter you very much depend on players coming in in shape. If the players are not in shape, you've got a problem. Now, the second thing it leads to is that the beginning of the season in the NBA and in the G League is basically still the preseason, right? So the first 10 games, players are still getting in shape. Teams are still figuring things out. And that's a massive difference again to Germany, right? And to Turkey where like, lower money teams basically invest more in the preseason so they can come and start the season well perhaps steal one or two or three games right to fight relegation and and in uh in the nba and in the g league it's just different you know like we practice a lot apparently in in our team salt lake city we had last season 51 games 
and we had 53 practices and that's apparently a lot you know so it's again that that baseline is so different than europe and and i think explains a lot you know uh, because there are so many games you have to monitor practice also you cannot go two and a half hours it, it just doesn't work because you will kill your players you know you have to be very accurate you have to be very thoughtful you have to be very precise with what you do in a pretty short period of time you know so um i i think that that that's a big difference and kind of explains why the game is um why the game is uh, uh sometimes tactically perhaps a little bit like easier uh, or simpler not not bad worse or dumb no by no means but just like there is not enough time to put a lot of stuff in you know that kind of explains itself i think one thing that is a massive difference over here is the size of the coaching staffs you know like adam chan he basically told me my g league staff is a euro league staff i have got three full-time assistants I've got an athletic coach, a physiotherapist. I've got a director of basketball operations who organizes everything. I've got two interns, you know, so you can get a lot of stuff done. Uh, why is it like that? I think the one thing is overall the money in the system is good. So, you know, staffs are big. Um, I think a big reason for the big staffs in the NBA and in the G League um, is skill development. The resources are big, but the one thing that America has not got is time. There is no time. You know, we don't have practice time. There is no time between games. So the size of staff really helps you with the skill development because you can assign each coach to a certain amount of players and really be focused with the skill development. Although you don't have a lot of time, you've got staff. So you kind of catch up a little bit, you know. One more reason for big staffs is in America, the coaches uh, semi-practice, you know, let's say a shell drill, defensive shell drill here will always be with coaches. There will never be players against players because you have to watch the intensity so much. The coaches play a big role, you know, so it's like always going to be coaches and a four and four. It's, it's often going to be like semi, uh, semi live drills where coaches are involved, you know. So that's another reason for the size of those um, of the staffs. You know, I, I talked about skill development. I think one big misunderstanding, I think, is in Europe, we say we develop players better than in America. I think we develop youth players better than in America from a tactical and from a technical standpoint, I really think we do a better job. Um, I do think, though, as soon as players get into the professional basketball, America does a much better job of skill development than Europe. It's almost, I, I don't know why, but I really believe. Like, in Europe... You know, it just, it's just not a lot of skill work anymore in the professional level. And here it is a big, big focus. So it's very interesting. You know, I think we do a better job in the youth. I think America does a better job uh, in the professional, on the professional level, you know. Um, it it kind of took me a while to, to figure this out, you know. Um, the roster, especially in the G League, like if, if you're a coach and you're recruiting in the G League, it's very difficult to recruit in the G League, like for a European team, because you have to understand the context of the game. Like, and it starts with the roster. So my team is, a roster is put together by assigned players from the NBA team, you know? So they send you one or two players who should get like playing time, you know? Then you've got the two-way players um, who can make up to almost $400,000 uh um before taxes um and the two-way players you've got two of those who can move up and down at almost all times i think the two-way players are hurting the european market a lot by the way like it's just like very good young players missing on the european market then you've got exhibit 10 players those guys are four players 
who are in training camp with the Utah Jazz, but then come to me. Those guys are called Exhibit 10 players or training camp players. And then you've got like six or seven extra players who are so-called rights guys. You've got the rights to these players, you know. So basically you have a roster of players who make like from $1.5 million dollars to $400,000 to $85,000 to $35,000, you know? So you've got a huge, like, um, you know, there's a big, big uh, difference in salaries. There is a difference in, in quality, you know? And there is also a big flexibility in who plays when, because I don't have the call When do the assigned players play for me or not? I don't know when the two-way players play for me or not. Often, it happens that we are in a shoot-around, and while shoot-around, a player gets pulled from the shoot-around and has to fly out to a different NBA city because somebody got injured on the NBA team, you know? So this, like, flexibility um, and this difference in, in players um makes this league very difficult to understand you know it may be that on monday one team is the best team in the g league everybody's there all players all the talent is there and it may be on friday uh the team is not very good you know because players are missing you know and if we as europeans are scouting in the g league is you just have to know you know you just have to understand you know um and then you know All this movement in players and the difference in quality in players and the little practice time leads to tactical differences in the game, right? So like tactical differences are, there is generally speaking, not as much, you cannot do as much as in Europe. You know, you don't have the consistency in the team and you don't have the practice time. So there is less stuff you put in. The, the playbook will be shorter the set plays are much shorter than in Europe. There is more from a tactical standpoint, you want to attack a mismatch early and you want to gain an advantage and play from there. There is much less um, like long camouflage plays in order to get the defense moving in order to run the pick and roll like we do in Europe. There's much less and there is much less because especially in the G League, I cannot practice. Like, I will not have all guys in practice, you know, so it will just be difficult to even, like, practice these things, you know, you have to keep it a little bit simpler, not dumber, but simpler, you know. Um, tactical difference, in the NBA and in the G League, you very rarely see pressing defense, right? I think the main reason, the two reasons, the one is the amount of plays, The amount of games. There are so many games. It's very difficult to keep the intensity. Um, and the other difference, I think, is like mentality. It's very, very difficult to get um, um, like, I, I want to say experienced and older and veteran NBA players to buy into like uh, uh, pressing for a long time. We were Uh, basically the only G League team this season that pressed, but also very selectively, like very selectively only on dead ball situations, you know, because again, it's very difficult to do over a 50 game span in five months. You know, you've got to just watch the legs, you know, you've got to keep the legs. So, you know, um, I, I think, I think the last, the last like difference I want to talk about before we talk about like some defensive uh, uh, principles is like, Game scouting, you know, like the preparation for games, we do scout very detailed, but um, you have to be very, very careful of what you give to the players. It's the same in Europe, but just to a different extent. You know, it's um, you play so many games and you really have to watch that the players don't like lose focus. And if you throw too much of the opposing team stuff at your players it's not going to stick in their heads and in their muscle memory so you have to be very selective of what you give them and how much you give them and in this league 
you kind of go back to the basics. It really is more about what you do yourself and how good you do it yourself. So it is a little bit back to like youth basketball. And again, I think in Europe, it's the same. On the highest level, it's the same. I, I, I assume if you, you know, if you ask uh, um, Ataman, if you ask Cheko Obradovic, yes, they will for sure say the main thing is how good are you at what you do, right? But um, the, the amount of scouting and focus on the opponent is still a lot. And it's less here. It's less. Not nothing, but less. And you have to be very, very selective with what you give to your team. And again, it, it leads to focusing on the basics and uh, being good at what you do. So I really enjoyed this a lot. Um, I really enjoyed this part a lot. That um, I had to go back. I had to think about the basic things. I had to think about what do we want to be good at. And uh, I had to become good at coaching and teaching it, you know. So, um, so let's talk about defense. You know, if somebody has a question, please go ahead. Like, if, if somebody's there, just, just go ahead. If not, then not. Whatever. Uh, there is no question. And you go, I have a couple of it, but you already answered it. <laughs> <laughs> okay hey wh okay. whatever what are you you tell me okay so please go ahead uh, so defense okay our um defensive our defensive uh, like uh, principles are um are the same as the basic principles of the utah jazz and quinn snyder okay we call them defensive absolutes um it's a it's a way to structure your defense which kind of came from the San Antonio Spurs. So it's like, you know, this like San Antonio Spurs coaching tree, which Quinn Snyder comes from too. And I, I really like it. Um, so there are these five absolutes that we work with. So the first absolute is transition defense. Um, the second absolute will be no middle, no paint. We don't want to let an opponent into uh, the middle or the paint. The third absolute is if you get beat, uh, there has to be a help. So it's the cycle of help. The fourth absolute um, is contesting the shots, contest. And the fifth absolute is closing the possession. So rebounding, basically. Right. And um, so everything we do conceptually, everything we do practice wise, Everything we do post-game analyze-wise will always be based on these five absolutes. So we really like talk about it a lot due to the fact that we cannot practice it as much as in Europe. I believe you have to talk about it more. You know, it's like if you as I really believe if a coach um, wants to emphasize something, he has to emphasize it. It sounds dumb, but it's the truth. I think you cannot think because you tell a team one time, this is very important for us, that the team will know. I think you have to like go over and over and over again, you know. So those are the five absolutes that we will work off. Okay, I want to go into detail a little bit. So our transition defense basically starts with how many guys do we send back as we shoot the basketball? We send back three guys. So the perimeter guys, one, two, and three, will always be sent back. Um, the, we crash the glass with the four and the five. Sometimes against very fast teams, uh, the, the Utah Jazz, Quinn Snyder, even sends four guys back. So one, two, three, and four. Okay. Um, I, I, this is... Um, in Europe, this rarely happens. In Europe, it's more like you send like, right, two and a half, three, sometimes four guys to the offensive glass. Here, like the teams play so fast and everybody pushes the ball that uh, this transition defense is even more of a focus than in Europe. Um, so three back. Then our like base focus is rim, ball, and wall. So the first guy back will protect the rim. The closest guy to the basketball picks up the ball. And then the next guy to the basketball builds up a wall. So he gives an extra help to take away primary drives. 
The last thing is there is no man in transition. So it really doesn't matter if the five man picks up the basketball or the four man, the closest guy picks up the ball and we've got to match up with whoever and then we will scramble from there. I think one last teaching point for us is that the last guy sprinting back into defense is mainly focused on sprinting back to the weak side of the play because the opening or the open opponent who is not covered is usually on the weak side because the defense had shifted to the basketball, you know? So three guys back, rim ball wall, no man in transition, and then sprinting back to the weak side as the last guy, okay? We've got like two drills for this. We do these two drills. Um, this absolute, we practice every time. So in 53 practices, we did it 53 times. Shoot arounds play a big role here because you don't have a lot of practice time. Shoot arounds are almost a little practice here. We also do transition defense in every practice. It is less about the intensity, it's almost more about the teaching. Again, like the style of uh, practice is different due to the amount of games, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll go through, I'll show you a, a video real quick. I'll show you a video real quick on the transition defense. Let's see if this makes sense to you guys. Um, I hope you can see this. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. So here are the defensive absolutes. Transition defense, no middle, no paint, cycle of help, contest, and then close, which is rebounding, right? And so transition defense, rim, ball, wall. The ball goes up, and we're going to send three back. So the shooter is going to shoot and get back. The opposite guy in the corner is going to get back. Right. I know this is normally a pretty good offensive rebounding position, but we really send them back. Okay. And these guys are back. In this case, it's even four guys back. And now it's rim, ball, wall. So the first guy has to protect the rim. Okay. Not sure if this is a perfect picture. The closest guy to the basketball has to pick up the basketball. Okay. And then the next guy to the basketball builds up a wall. This is this guy. Okay. And being active here plays a big role for us. Normally it's a big who builds up the wall, rim ball and wall. We'll give you another example. Give you another example right here. The ball gets inbound and it gets pushed. And this is how they play a lot in the G League. Even on makes, the ball gets pushed, right? Closest guy picks up the basketball. Next close guys build up a wall. Rim ball and wall. Okay, so these are our, our teaching points and we, we hammer it home. We, we really try to focus, really try to focus on these things. The next, next absolute for us is no middle, no paint, okay? So um, in a in a one-on-one -on -one situation, we do not want to give up the middle and we do not want to give up the paint, okay? So um, we will, our feet are orientated on the three-point line. We use the three-point line as, as, as an orientation for our feet. Our inside foot is a little higher than the outside foot, okay? That's the general rule for us. Our pick and roll defense is the same. So we push away from the screen. We keep everything on the side. So this one-on-one -on -one principle goes hand in hand with the pick and roll principle. Okay. I think uh, if we get beat, then we don't want to give up the paint. So at, in the paint, we have to get physical. We have to build up a stone wall, we call it. We have to like, you know, be able also as a guard to take away, uh, you know, the opponent penetrating the paint, okay? I think the main technique for this absolute, no middle, no paint, is closeouts. We will work on closeouts in an isolated form, like every third practice, you know? We've got like two drills for it, and our focus on the closeouts is pretty basic. We call it high school closeouts. All of us 
All of us have done it and all of us have taught it on the youth level. Two thirds of the way sprint, one third of the way is chopping our feet. Big focus for us is if you're guarding a shooter, you have to show your fingers early on your closeout. Like you have your low stance, but you show your fingers early. I really believe you take away, uh, you take away shots like that. One more thing in the closeouts for us is from a tactical standpoint, all closeouts on the corner for corner three, we always close out aggressively to the body of the opponent. Because we say everybody can shoot the corner three. It's the highest percentage shot from three. So no matter if it's a shooter or a driver, we always close that out very, very aggressively. Okay. So we'll work on those closeouts again, like three times, uh, like every third practice, every third practice we'll work on that. Okay. Um, I'll go into the video just to talk about it a little bit. So no middle, no paint. Okay. In this case, we're not talking about closeouts. We're just talking about the stance, right? Okay. Here comes a closeout. Okay. That's fine. And now I get beat, but I don't get beat into the middle right? Like building up this wall is big for us. And we basically say, this is why you go and lift weights, you know, like to be strong, you know, and to have a strong core to keep guys out of the middle, no middle, no paint. Inside foot high, outside foot lower, no middle and no paint. We call this an absolute. The switch in this case, no middle and no pain. Okay, so the next absolute will be cycle of help. What happens if I get beat? What happens if I get beat? And um, so we teach the cycle of help, helping and helping for the helper like everybody, like all of us teach it in a shell drill, right? Like different forms of shell drills, right? Like a perfect position shell drill, a cutting shell drill, a driving shell drill, where we help and give the help for the helper, okay? So this cycle of help is the next absolute that we teach. Um, one thing that over here is, is not a big top, the defensive three seconds, um, that everybody talks about do not really play a role like it is more uh, it doesn't get called you know I think the Utah Jazz in 82 games last season had like two defensive three second calls so it's not a big topic you know um, we encourage our team to get defensive three seconds we want to sit in there so it's not a big topic the bigger problem with helping and then closing out again again is the space of the floor you know so so the cycle of help is the next absolute, you know, that we will coach every game, that we will coach every practice, that we will coach in the analyzation of the game and base our analyzation on, okay? So the cycle of help, okay? Um, the cycle of help. Just to give you examples, and I know this is nothing, absolutely nothing new, you know? But I like to organize your defense like this. If I get beat, I want to get beat to the baseline and not to the middle. The cycle of help comes here. Here comes the help. Here comes the help for the help. Right? And we go from there. If I get beat, I want to get beat to the baseline. Here comes the help. Here's the help for the helper. We keep rotating. We get beat again. Here comes the help into a vertical contest. the switch we've got the big on the guard we like to teach this we, we like to teach i like this a lot we call it fencer hand like a fencer you know in olympic fencing like a sword fight right like we like to have the inside hand up contest the shot and take away the drive at the same time we always feel in switches especially in the g league and guards like to pull up more than to drive so we kind of trust our big to just have your hand up, contest the shot early and take away the drive at the same time. It's not easy to teach because players often think they're off balance, but I really believe in it. So here comes the help. Here comes the help for the helper. 
Here comes the shift guy shifting down. And then this is what we, what we call the, 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 the cycle of hell. Okay. And we'll, again, we'll base, we'll base our defensive teaching of these absolutes. It helped me a lot as a coach, helped me a lot as a coach, just to put clear structure to it. You know, the next thing is if somebody beats you, we help the ball gets kicked out. Now we ask every shot to be contested, right? So every shot has to be contested. Um, I think one big thing on teaching the contests is you want to leave your feet second. We, I hate, or every coach hates, if you bite on shot fakes, right? Here comes a shot fake and you jump up as a defender and you give up the drive. So you want to leave your feet second. I kind of like that term. Um, and um, we actually, we never fly by. We don't fly contest and fly by because we want to box out. Um, we will get off the floor to jump at guys on the contest if we are really late, okay? One thing that I think they teach very well over here, and I know they do in Europe too, but I, I really kind of took it from here. I like it, is <clears throat> the vertical contest at the rim. We teach the vertical contest at the rim. I think it's very important. I think it's especially very important for guards to contest at the rim and get up vertically without fouling. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you some examples. So the vertical contest we teach, the regular contest on a shot we don't teach. We just talk and coach, uh, you know, on, on video. And again, we, we ask every shot to be contested. We take notes. We, um, uh, we chart it, you know, so we can keep guys accountable. Okay, so here's the contest, right? I hope you guys can see. <clears throat> so obviously, we'll ask for these contests. We get beat middle. Ball gets kicked. We contest, we fly by, okay? Not necessarily very good, but okay. We've got another guy contesting the shot. That's what we're gonna ask for. Cycle of help, rotate, showing fingers early on the closeout. This is important for us, especially in the corners. We close out to the body, stunt, contest. Okay, so this contest is an absolute for us. Every shot has to be contested. And the absolutes can be controlled. That's why we call them absolutes, right? We can control if we contest every shot, right? It's a question of effort. And we want to give this effort. So here are the vertical contests. <coughs> they talk about it a lot here. And I think they do a good job. Vertical contest. Obviously, the uh, athleticism plays a role. But even if you're not super athletic, I think if you get up vertically, if you get up vertically, it's difficult for the opponent to score the basketball. At least you make it tougher for him. So that's the vertical contest, right? And then the last absolute on the defensive end for us um, is close, finish the possession, box out. So... I, I will say that we practice box outs. I know that like in the, for us as coaches, boxing out is very, very important, right? It's, one, it's probably the second most important defensive technique, but often, uh, often we don't coach it. Or we don't practice it, right? Because we say nobody should get injured, et cetera, et cetera. To be honest, I never understood that. Like I, you know, I practice it. So I, I just believe, you know? So we've got one drill, the intensity, is not necessarily high. You don't want to get injured. Um, but the thing that we actually teach is like, you want to take a step towards your opponent. That's important, I believe. Often, just taking a step towards the opponent gives you an angle on rebounding the basketball. And the second thing we do is, if the rebounder comes from the corner, you want to wedge him to the baseline. You want to put him behind the backboard, right? You want to put him in prison so he can't rebound the ball. How you box out, technically, I will say this, we are not very detailed. Either you can face, you can do it like with the arm bar front or you can turn into him 
I, I, I don't know if I'm good coaching it. I don't know, but we are not very detailed there. It's just like initiate the contact, you know, however you want to do. Okay. So the closing would be the last absolute uh, for us. And again, absolute, we feel you can, you can box out. Like this little box out right here will usually already do it, right? This year, like boxing out, uh, face guarding him in the box out, all good. Just initiating the contact will usually get you the ball. This is Nigel Williams Goss down here, wedging him under the board, right? Under the rim. So the teammate can get the basketball, right? So, so that will be the closing, right? Okay. So those are the absolutes that they work with here. I think conceptually you have to add one big, big part, which is like obviously pick and roll defense. And then conceptually for us, it's pressing, but only on dead balls. Okay in a certain way. Um, but again, like it helped me a lot as a coach, like taking these absolutes and always like keeping the guys accountable for these absolutes. And I think sometimes we make basketball complex, but <clears throat> the reality is I liked what, like I read this on, uh, yeah, Ettore Messina said it and I kind of liked it. He said uh, two things. He said, defensively, if you struggle defensively, um, if you can fix your transition defense and if you can fix your rebounding a little bit, then you will exponentially get better defensively, right? And then the other thing he said, like, no matter where you are in America, Europe, wherever, like good teams, as, as stupid as it sounds, like good teams will always give an effort on defense and they will always to a certain amount, like move the basketball on offense. And I know it like it sounds like profound, right? It sounds easy, but I kind of I like that like uh, like these quality coaches like that like say it, right? It it makes sense. And for me coaching wise, it really like makes sense like working with this structure, you know, of absolutes where also if I watch a game and analyze the game, I can go back and say, "Hey, listen, uh, this, this, this was good, but no, we were not good at this. And usually if we struggle in, in two of the three absolutes, you know, we'll have a bad defensive showing, you know? So I kind of liked it. I hope it has helps you thinking and your thinking and yeah, you know, guys, if you got any questions, shoot. <laughs> uh, thank you. It was very compact uh, speech. We, we follow you. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, on the first part of it, uh, you use the word context of the game. Yeah. Uh, I was I I was asking that question, but now I'm decide to ask him again. Maybe you may repeat, but maybe you can explain better with different words. So uh, Euroleague teams doesn't look from uh, G League to recruit some players, but. Uh, lower teams is uh, in Europe looking for some uh, G League maybe during the season as well. Um, what is your um, advice for the European coaches? How we recruit the players from G League? You say that you should know the context. So can you explain a little bit with different words the context of the game? Yeah. So I think... The first thing is, uh, I, the G League is full of players. I think, I, I very, very much believe in the G League, there are a lot of Euro Cup players. In the G League, there are some Euro League players. In the G League, there are some NBA players. In the G League, there are also second league Turkish players, second league German players, you know? So uh, I think understanding the fact that you will have a potential EuroLeague player playing together with a second or third league player also reflects on how that like EuroLeague player looks in the game, right? You know, so it's like always, if you play with better players, you will look better too, especially pick and roll players. 
and especially pick and pop players like especially um especially like rim rolling fives in this league the pick and roll often is not the pick and roll it's like a pick and drive you know like the guards get a pick and then they drive the basketball and don't look for the primary or secondary or third pass right and i think just knowing this you know should help you in the recruiting process it doesn't make it easier for sure not but like knowing it you know helps you know what i mean so for example we had tyler Cavanaugh last year on two-way he went to alba berlin to a euroleague team and uh, i think he's a euroleague player um and and if he's not a euroleague player he's a very good euro cup player for sure um I think he may actually fit Turkey better than Germany, but that's a different topic. Um, so, um, again, like he he will look he will he, he, with a point guard who doesn't pass the ball is going to be difficult to look good as a as a um, as a pick and roll big, for example, right? Um, so, so that's what I mean with the context of the game, you know. Also. I, I think, and I catch myself, and, and you guys know, like for sure, like uh, Tolga knows for sure. Like you, if you watch a team, I don't know a team in Turkey that you don't like the style of play so much, okay? And because a player plays on the team where you don't like the style of play so much, you kind of put the player in the bucket of this style of play, right? But that's not all the way correct, you know? So it's like, so that's what I mean with the context of the game. It's very difficult to scout, but you only have to know this at least to be open-minded, you know? Um, I, I hope this makes sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ahmet, sen sorar mısın lütfen? Hi, coach. Glad to have you here tonight. Um, What would you like to say uh, about the future of G League? I mean, uh, you know, there is a Jalen Green case uh, and uh, a young man who decided to, decide to sign with a G League team instead of college. And uh, this is an interesting case, old fashioned way to be a, <laughs> to be a professional basketball. Uh, and uh, this may affect Euro League as well. Uh, you know, so, uh, um, uh, and my second question is, uh, do, um, Do you have any room for uh, tweaking something uh, com which comes from the Mr. Snyder? I, I mean, you you can change your uh, defensive plans, maybe offensive plans, or you have to execute what he or his team wants. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Ahmed, what what's up? Um, yeah, I think. Uh, okay, so I think two things. I think the G League has gotten. Uh, Uh, much more accepted and much more interesting just due to a financial fact. You know, like um, the Exhibit 10 players, the players who get a training camp invite to the NBA and then play G League, the four guys, they make $85,000, which in the context of Europe, if you're a good player, is not a lot. But it is much more than the $35,000, which it was before. You know, and it leads to Americans who have had a solid career so far and have played three or four years in Europe who would normally, for a financial reason, never come and play. It help, It leads to them playing for a G League team, you know, because at least it is enough money to justify, you know. The other thing is you are at home. It's a big factor that I think we never thought about. Like you are at home. You only play six months, five to six months, which is a short period of time. You are close to the NBA. I do think that uh, NBA call-up is obviously easier from the G League. So there are things that when I was in Europe, I never understood. Like I was like, why would you go to the G League for that little money? If you can play for a middle pack Turkish or German team for 150,000 euros net, Why would you go for $85,000 before taxes to play G League? But I tell you, it is a motive for the guys, you know? Um, so that's the one thing. So I think due to the money, it's getting more attractive. Uh, 
a lot of teams are really using the G League uh, as a tool, you know, as a farm team. Like we take a lot of pride in it. Um, so I think there is more acceptance. I think there is more uh, smart usage, you know. So everybody says it's going to go up. Everybody says the money is going to go up. And now I really believe with Corona and Europe being hit so hard with sponsor money missing, I think the G League will be even better. I think the Exhibit 10 players next year will be of higher quality than they were before, you know? Yeah. So for us Europeans, it sounds crazy in a way, but it's, it's reality, you know, it's reality. And uh, the other thing you said with the, with the young uh, high school players, um, it's actually like this, you know, they, I know that they were, they don't want Australia basically to take the high school players like Lamelo Ball, right? Uh, um, and have them in the time where they cannot go pro yet uh, instead of the G League. So the G League is putting a big emphasis on kind of getting those guys. You know, Ahmed, I will be honest, I don't know how, how it will work out, how it will work, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, but the, the NBA is basically putting a big emphasis on saying, hey, we don't want to lose those guys, you know? <laughs> so that's the one thing. The other thing is, um, so what's very important for Coach Snyder uh, uh, is that we keep everything defensively very tight and basically the same, you know? So our defensive concepts are the same. We guard pick and roll defense a little bit differently. We, we, um, we push to the sideline but our bigs were up and aggressive on the level of the screen with Rudy Gobert, obviously like they play like center field defense, you know? So that's a little bit different. Um, that's a little different, but other than that, everything was the same, you know, because for us, it was always important. If somebody goes up and gets two or three minutes, you know, obviously they have to guard. They will not be asked to shoot the basketball any, right? So it's like the defensive end is very tight. Offensively, conceptually, we are the same. I think the reason I got the job was because I came from Europe and Utah plays a very European style, you know? Um, so conceptually, we are the same, but like set plays, et cetera, he gives a lot of freedom, you know, which, uh, which is very, you know, which is very nice. I hope this answers the question. Thank you very much. Uh, even though you have a, the different you have completely different set on the court but uh, it's a way to, <laughs> to end. thank you very much of course Erdem. martin <laughs> Erdem. good good to see you over here really good to see you and 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 uh, really sharing your experiences all the information you give i think it's very valuable for us to understand the concept over there and and making our comparison between here and over there i'll just want you to i know we had long discussions about this but can you give our uh, can you give us about the routines of the nba players about their individual workouts, because like you said, uh, it's much more important to have uh, the team practice uh, than having team practice these individual workouts. And I see that all, all, all those assistant coaches taking care of one player. And this is because that process is making players to develop. Although you don't have that chance, but somehow uh, G League players are improving. And I, I, I please you to evaluate this, to give us an example about the routine during the season, because maybe you know that you said in EuroLeague right now, uh, Europe or, uh, you know, it's possible to have two practices a day, but now it's not because yes. uh, European players, uh, Euro EuroLeague Players Association had an agreement with EuroLeague and, and now it's forbidden. You can just have uh, one practice a day and you have to give one full day off in a week for a player. So it's getting closer to NBA uh, from different, different sides. So can you please evaluate it? And about your players, uh, the development that you, you focus during this uh, lack of practice time, just having games, 
but how you try to improve the, your players because it's very important i think for us uh, for young players and also for coaches um, and upper upper uh, leagues like senior leagues yeah um so um as Adam, as you and I, right, have talked about it quite a bit, I think, um, as I said before, the time is the only thing that we don't have, right? But the resource of a lot of coaches helps a lot, right? So you can, right, like a lot of coaches can really help a lot. So now the key question is like, where do we, where do you work out, right? When do you work out, right? For us, it's like, actually, I want to say three, three times. So the one is, individual work and combo work like putting together a point guard and a center right or uh, uh whatever a wing and a four man and whatever actions you run it in the game and individual work and we do these two things before practices it's only 20 minute like it's a 20 minute segment not every practice but right the 20 minute segment uh, before practice where we put the guys in different uh, 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 stations and work them individually. Okay, so that's kind of the one area where we do it. And then I think a huge, huge thing is the vitamins before games, right? So everybody who's watched like an NBA game live in the arena, the warm-up is very, very, very different to the warm-up in Europe. Like the warm up before an NBA and G League team is used for individual work. So the warm ups are very individualized. We have point guards, wings, shooting bigs, and bigs. So it's four groups, and every group has got a 20 minute window, a 10 minute window on the floor, a 10 minute window like mobilization before working on the floor. So basically, out of 50 games in the regular season, we work 50 times individually, right? And it's always, I want to call, in Germany, we say like a, a drop of, a little drop of water on the stone, right? Like it's always like 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, right? So, um, so uh, those are the area or the times where we work individually. And I think, again, I think they do a really good job. Like I... I learned a lot. I, I, I really, I really learned a lot and I, I really believe in it. Thank you. I'll, I'll have one more question about psychological part of this game. Um, you remember one of the game preparation during the walkthrough, uh, one of the player, rookie player, was uh, whistling during the walkthrough. And I was really surprised because the, everyone else, all the coaches, everyone else was such a normal thing for them and, and life goes on you know and he, he went out like whistling yeah so it's not it's not really normal in our conditions in europe um you know one player during the walkthrough doing this and how you guys handle that and that players get more mature during this time period or somehow uh, you are able to deal with that or or he goes how he goes i i remember exactly i told your story often so, so I think, Erin, I really think this was one of the biggest adjustments. When I got here, I think the evaluation of players and character is a little bit different, especially in the G League, right? Like when I got here for my interview, it was like, hey, you have to understand the G League is basically full of like difficult characters and we hope that they are at the right point in their career where they've overcome their demons, let's say, and they can be NBA players. Okay, that was what was told me, you know? So I think there is like, a, 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 and this is deeply philosophical, like, right? Like this is also like deeply, I think like, really like if you like look at America and Turkey or America and Germany, right? There's different, uh, different uh, values, different understanding of how do you act within a group, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it, it, to be honest, my biggest thing was, and we are like actually a very good G League team by standings and by success, etc. I think one of the biggest successes, oh no, the reason for the successes that, to be honest, I brought a completely European approach and just got good characters. Like it was like, you know, like we just cleaned house and, 
and got good characters. And we put a huge emphasis on getting good characters and try to stay away from those situations as much as possible. Because I will be honest, I can't handle it. Like, I can handle it. You know, I have to handle it. But I still believe that the, the overall success of a group in America or in Europe will come down to character, you know? And uh, so I'm completely on your side. I know I'm not answering the question. Like, obviously, if you have that challenge, um, you have to address it and you have to work it and step by step, you know? I think the coaching style overall here is different. Like, it's, it's much less, like, absolute and le much less aggressive, I want to say, right? It's more managing. It's more touching. It's more uh, like massaging things in. It's more trying to touch players, uh, creating, um, creating relationships with players is huge. I think I always underestimated big time. I really believe, you know, and I think there is a reason for it. I think the upbringing of a lot of athletes is different here. I think through the AAU system and a lot of money in the AAU system, players already like get so much like right like emphasis and also money when they're young that they don't get used to being criticized and if they get criticized they just change the club right if they get criticized nowadays they just change the college right so it's it's not easy and i think it's almost a cultural thing i know i know adam i'm not answering the question 100 percent, but you know it's a it's a philosophical thing right Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mars. Başka sorusu olan var mı? Tolga. Var var. Tolga, hey. Hey, Martin. It's great to have you here, huh? Thank you. I, mean, I want to thank you. I've been listening to you from the very beginning. It's, it's been really, really, I mean, effective and productive meeting with the coaches. I have one question because when I listen to you, uh, G League is a, to me still development league. You know, I mean the guys coming out there who develop, and all these uh, principals by NBA team or GMs or owners, whatever, or head coach of the NBA teams, based on how you can develop a player uh, in a G League team. So since, since you don't have too many practice time and a lot of games and sometimes you don't have the guys which you had like previous day, you have like maybe don't have top three guys, you know, they go to the NBA team or they get called up from some other NBA team. So as far as developing, when we talk about developing a player, we have to talk about teaching, okay? In your case, I think it's a lot of time in Europe, same thing. This is what I believe. In-game teaching is important. I think player learns two ways effective. The one what you mentioned is video. The other day, Scott Roll was talking about it and we all know it. The other thing is getting bigger and bigger every season in Europe and as well as in the States probably, in-game teaching. Why I ask this, because you mentioned the uh, roster, st staff like number of the people in the staff. Yeah. So I think this is big time and it's going to get bigger and important and important in Europe. So what can you say about it? You know, this is what I believe. I don't know if you agree or not, but in-game teaching is important. What the coaches or staffs should manage to teach guys in-game, game time, you know, like, because it's a great time to look, teach them something. I... I agree. I think uh, I think that um, first of all, what you said, like it's the development league, right? So it's actually a, it's it's really actually a fantastic league. You know, like it's a fantastic league with yeah. resources and just the opportunity to play, and you can mold it however you want to do, basically, right? Also, a fantastic league for coaches, like. Because think about the in-game learning for myself, right? So it's like, yeah. I coached three seasons here. This season, we played 42 games, the seasons before. So I almost like coached 150 games in three seasons. That's almost four and a half seasons in Europe. You know, different game, yes, yeah. but you know. So, but to your point, I believe like the way we 
uh, organize it in a very short answer is this. So we've got coaches assigned to players. I've got three full-time assistant mm -hmm. coaches. So all three are assigned to like three or four guys. I am assigned to the stretch fours, you know, uh, yeah. but, but so there. And then also in the game, they kind of stick with their assignment, you know? And, and yeah. so in the game, as they come off the court, like those guys also stick to their assigned players and coach them on the bench, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's the way we organize it. I don't know if this, if this answers the question, but that's like our form of organization. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and, and then Tolga, and then what you said, the video stays the same too. I, I really think like in the NBA, they are very, very diligent with this like okay you know it's post game every game and how often in europe have we thought oh i would love to show this guy but i don't have the time i don't have the resource yes. right i yes. i have to take care of the whole video i can't and here everybody is assigned and you your job as a coach is like to show the guy the video you know and it yeah. turns into a very detailed conversation and work process um, which I really respect. Like, I really think they do good, like really, really, really good job. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Excuse me. I, I, I just would like to add one, one thing about that to uh, Tolga Abi about this. In, in Europe, what I observe, the head coaches are not giving that kind of responsibility to their assistant coaches. Like, they don't have that much of a trust Either, I will be honest, either to themselves, they don't have that confidence or, or they don't want to share that responsibilities with they, their players. So in, in, in NBA, what I see or G League, once they give these uh, assignments to coaches, they say that, okay, he's going to handle it. He's going to teach the bases or whatever. So that coach can go to that player. And by the same time, that coach is making individual practice with that player. Yes. Another mistake that we are doing, we are not managing oh. our staff, giving them responsibilities, working with players. We are just saying that, hey, okay, today this and these players will work like that. Okay, but we need to make points like you as a coach. Yeah. You are responsible with these players all day long with these details. So in the game, if anything's go wrong, he's going to turn his head to you. Not to me, mm -hmm. because I trust you that you can do that. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the biggest problem we have in Europe. Okay, it's, yes. uh, we have to be honest with uh, ourselves, first of all. We need to have confidence that we are doing what we know what we are doing. This is one of the uh, problems. Sorry, I just want to... No, 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 oh, Adam. No, uh, let, me, let me back up to Adam. This is why I asked the question. I always... And not always, but often talk to Murat about this. This is the uh, next step the coaching staffs in Europe should take. Okay. Ego free coaching staff and head coach has to have more confidence on his staff to give them more responsibilities and live with it, you know. And when I look at the NBA staffs, former head coaches become assistant coach, you know, like Maurice Chicks. Big time head coach, now he's assistant coach. You can have so many names like this, but this is the another decision European basketball should take as far as the building and using the staff. Uh, this is a great topic though. I agree. There will, at a certain point in time, there, uh, I think at a certain point in time, there is a different challenge. Like if the staffs get too big, Yes, you know, you're right. <laughs> we, we are far away from that in Europe. We are far away from that in Europe. Yes, it is. No, no. Başka uh, eklemek bir şeyler eklemek isteyen var mı? Son 10 dakikaya girdik. Last 10 minutes for Martin. If any question, sorusu olan var mı? <laughs> Yok gibi duruyor. Uh, okay. Martin, first of all. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very, very clear, <coughs> and, uh, ha very helpful. And thank to Tolga also make the uh, network with you. And anytime we are here to like your hand or your ear or you, you can use our networks as well. Uh, take care of yourself. 
be healthy uh, and good luck for the the coming season thank you thank you very much all all i want is iskender kebab <laughs> Hey guys, thank you very much. Okay, talk soon. Okay, thank you. Okay.